I found the safest place to be in any attack was in the assault wave because we were upon the enemy before he knew we were coming. We escaped much of a small arms fire and in addition we didn't get the retaliation from his artillery that the waves following us got. And in this town, uh, as we did on all of our objectives, each company commander and separate uh, platoon that was ordered to take a certain position uh, followed the practice of writing a message on an egg, on a fresh egg, uh, that they had taken their objective and what time, and sent this by a messenger to the battalion sergeant major at battalion headquarters. And this is where we got our fresh eggs as we crossed Germany. As we were leaving for the attack that night, the first sergeant said, take it easy and don't get hurt. I said, sure, I won't, but I knew right then that I was going to get it, and a half an hour later I did. We had been fighting then for 10 weeks, and we brought back a spirit of feeling of confidence, not only in the staff, but also in the, the regiments, battalions, and even com uh, companies, which really uh, put us in good stead for the future. These are the men who served in the 84th Infantry Division during the final months of World War II. First committed to action on the Siegfried Line in November 1944, they were quickly caught up in the Battle of the Bulge and the series of conclusive engagements that followed. This is their story. December 1944. In a last effort to regain the military initiative, Hitler had ordered a major counteroffensive in the Ardennes. As fog and sleet grounded all Allied planes, German infantry and panzer units swept 50 miles into Belgium, recapturing the key road junctions of Saint-Vie and La Rouche and surrounding the defenders of Bastogne. A major part of the German attack was turned against the town of Marsh, Belgium, the key to the River Mew, beyond which lay Paris, only recently liberated, and Antwerp, the Allies' chief supply port. The 4th Infantry Division had hurriedly left the Siegfried Line and had taken up defensive positions along the Marsh Houghton Road. Only by the most heroic resistance would the Allies be able to hold in the flanks of the Nazi salient and keep the enemy line from bulging further westward. I'm Richard K. Hawkins. I was a first lieutenant with A Company 334th Infantry of the 84th Infantry Division. We were spread over an extremely wide frontage. Our rifle company actually covered close to a mile in, in uh, width with foxholes of two men each, roughly about 100 yards apart. This is perhaps four to five times the usual amount of frontage that a rifle company will cover in a defensive situation. There were several times when Our forces were attacked by great numbers of tanks. In one instance, uh, near the village of Verden, approximately 200 inf enemy infantry and nine Tiger tanks attacked us and actually overran our position. This was one of the few times in which it became necessary for me to call down artillery fire on our own position. casualties during the Battle of the Bulge were 
much higher than ours due to the fact that primarily they were expending themselves against uh, defensive position, and this happens in any battle. However, they had far overextended their supply lines, and, and many of the troops that we captured had not had any food for some time. And I would say that their casualties outnumbered ours by at least three to one. This stately chateau, situated at the edge of the village of Verden, is the property of a Polish baron. During the December fighting, it became a house of horrors, as it was methodically disfigured by some of the bitterest hand-to-hand -hand fighting of the war. A member of the family recalls. My name is Elizabeth de Radisky, and I spent many days in the castle at Verden. We witnessed the whole battle, and I was with my father and a few people from the village, and some friends who had come here to find shelter. We spent five days and five nights in the cellar of the castle. First came the Germans, then Americans. Generally, we could not tell who was in the castle, although we did notice that the Americans wore rubber soles. They walked softly, whereas the Germans, who wore metal tips, were very noisy. Our food consisted of bread, some butter and ham. The real problem was to get water. We had to walk through corridors where Germans and Americans were often fighting in order to reach the faucet where we could get the water. Sometimes we would meet Americans, sometimes Germans. After the Ardennes offensive had begun, the weather suddenly cleared. Allied air reconnaissance and bombardment was now possible. Although Allied air superiority was complete, the ground fighting remained intense throughout the bulge. The turning point in the battle for Marsh came on December 26th. I'm Donald Phelps. I was a sergeant in the 333rd Infantry of the 84th Division. I was leading the company column on the left-hand side of the road, and the company commander was leading on the right-hand side. As we broke over the top of the hill, it became apparent that there were some armored vehicles ahead of us. I knew that we needed something to really go after vehicles of this type with, and that the bazooka, which was being carried by another man farther back in the first platoon, uh, did not come up as fast as I'd like. I found the bazooka back in the platoon behind me, but found the ammunition was across the road. I loaded once, got up real close, and fired. And I was very gratified that the bazooka worked properly and I made a good hit. I'd never fired one before. I made two or three back trips back to the ammunition supply and up and fired again. All of a sudden, somebody had spotted that we needed uh, some help in that area and some of our artillery fired. A piece of the shrapnel threw across my hand and arm and I, as it came, I felt it burn and I heard it bounce off the end of the bazooka. I realized I'd been hit, but it didn't seem too serious. One of the men near me also realized I'd been hit, and he came over to see if he'd give me aid. We succeeded in putting a tourniquet around my arm by using my belt, but then I started back down the road. After we got back to a couple of platoons, action was such that I could stand up and walk down the road 
And all I could think of was Merry Christmas, boys. My name is John Shaw. I fought as a buck private with the 84th Infantry Division during World War II. This excruciatingly cold night, remember trying to get a drink from my canteen, which was frozen solid. And so we started out through the woods, uh, crouching and uh, moving forward. And uh, then uh, someone yelled fire and, uh, and shout. And so we started firing and shouting. And the tracers went through the woods and uh, we moved on uh, in a kind of hysterical way, getting more and more uh, excited as we moved forward and, and heard more noise and, and were firing. We went uh, perhaps 20 feet or 25 feet and all of a sudden there was that uh, terrible noise that a person hates to hear, the little pop of a flare. And it was a German flare and it lit up the whole woods and there we were and there they were. The Germans then opened up with machine gun fire in 88s and, and uh, I know I had a, a kind of sinking feeling that this was it. I, uh, this was the first real fighting that, that uh, our company had been in, uh, where we were playing with the big boys and we knew that uh, this was for keeps and, and all of us were, were terrified. Uh, these machine gun bullets were firing a few feet off the ground and uh, then occasionally uh, as they would rake up and down this line of, uh, all through the woods, uh, occasionally they would dip down and then you'd hear somebody screaming from that section where they dipped down. And, they sprayed us uh, like uh, just, just as if they had a garden hose. They sprayed and sprayed, and then the uh, uh, more flares went up, and the tanks opened up directly again with uh, 88 fire. and the man on my right uh, on the other side who was uh, equally close was uh, was wounded uh, very seriously his kneecap was blown off and uh, the, the cries and shrieks of, of wounded really went up then and I, uh, I turned to the man on uh, my right and uh, put a tourniquet on his leg my name is Major General Bill Sutton and I was a battalion commander in the 84th Division in World War II. It was critically important for the 84th Division to hold the marsh Hutton Ridge and stop the attack. And only by the determination of the officers and men of the 84th Division and the expert leadership of General Bowling, the division commander, were they able to do this. After the German advance was stopped in the last few days of December, the Germans were noticed to be digging in in front of the position, which indicated they did not intend to continue attacking. The bulge would bulge no further. Hitler had again misjudged the capacity of the American soldiers. My name is Karl Theodor Siegfried Westphal. My last rank in the German army was that of a general of the cavalry. From the beginning of September 1944 until May 1945, I was commander of the general staff of Commander-in-Chief West. Hitler had a vast and extensive technical military knowledge, but he was a fanatic fanatics are known for their disability to keep a cool head and weigh their thoughts carefully. This, however, is an absolute necessity for the strategist. At the same time, Hitler was not inclined to consider the enemy capable of accurate and fast action. He was and remained a military dilettante. That is a voraussetzung for the strategy. Ebenso war er nicht geneigt dem Gegner richtiges und schnelles Handeln zuzubilden. 
daran ist er gescheitert. Er war und blieb ein militärischer Dilettant. The cost to Germany of Hitler's miscalculations would be staggering. More than a quarter of a million men dead, wounded or captured. At least 1,400 tanks and guns destroyed or abandoned. Slowly and painfully, the remnants of the once proud Wehrmacht retreated behind their shattered Western defenses. It was the beginning of the end. By the 3rd of February, the 84th Division had again moved back to their positions on the Siegfried Line. Their watery objectives lay before them. The Ruhr, the Rhine, and the Elbe. I'm Lieutenant General Lewis W. Truman. During World War II, I was a Colonel, Chief of Staff of the 84th Infantry Division, and Chief of Staff for Alexander R. Bowling, who was the Commanding General of the 84th Infantry Division. The Ruhr River crossing was one of the most thoroughly rehearsed river crossings of any unit in the European theater. The original crossing date was to be 10 February, but it was postponed because the Germans had flooded uh, the area. So we then had about two more weeks in which to work out all the details very thoroughly and to rehearse all the units for the overall operation. It's amazing that we ever got across the Ruhr River considering the confusion that takes place during the preparations for the attack. If you can imagine us being pitch dark uh, with a narrow road with uh, huge trucks with uh, fountains for the assault bridges to come later along one side of the road and a very narrow strip available to move up troops through. Uh, when you consider the uh, horrible noise of the artillery preparation which lasted for 45 minutes prior to our crossing during which time commands can't be heard and uh, it's very difficult to uh, give any orders and expect them to be carried out. had constructed a rather wide band of wire, barbed wire, on the far side of the Roar River and studied it with S mines, which uh, bounced up in the air when triggered off about six feet and exploded there, making it impossible for anybody to avoid the fragment. This mine field and barbed wire on the far side of the river made the Roar River one of the biggest little rivers in the world, as far as I was concerned. Before that day was over, we had two full infantry regiments across. The Germans were caught off balance. They did counterattack us at the town of Ball, but they were unable to organize themselves fast enough. And after three days, our position on the other side of the river was secure. It was General Bowling's impression at that time that the German soldier was no longer the same soldier whom we had faced earlier. The point now was to break through all of the resistance and give the enemy no time to catch his breath or to recover even for a moment. The final phase of the war began for us on 
April the 1st when we crossed the Rhine. Everything that we had was on wheels and they were all turning. We rolled across the northern part of Germany on autobahns for the most part uh, at great speeds and long convoys. Uh, this was uh, exciting because we were covering so much ground uh, compared to what it had been like on the Siegfried line earlier and uh, we rarely uh, had to get out of the trucks except when we'd run into a, a rash of firing then we'd have to jump out and run for cover and then after a while the uh, whatever difficulty would be taken care of and then we'd roll on again. If combat can be described as as fun uh, this was because uh, uh, the weather was fine and we were rolling and we were going through uh, a part of Germany which had not been uh, much shot up uh, and we saw civilians for the first time, uh, German civilians, uh, and we were able to shout at Fräuleins and do all the things soldiers like to do. Allied morale was high, for each man of the 84th knew that the war was near its end. During the more and more frequent lulls in fighting, there was time for a little relaxing, time even for the humorous anecdote. Army rations were pretty good, but one day after too many servings of corned beef, we spotted a half-starved German chicken. One of the men went out gutting for it. He was using an M1 rifle, but he had armor-piercing bullets in it. The soup we made that night, we had to strain the bones through our teeth. I am Fritz Kramer. I was with the 84th Division as a rather elderly soldier from my 35th to my 37th year. In one respect, I have to admit, however, I probably was not a very typical and normal soldier. I did like the army food. I wanted to get lots of food. I got it. I wanted to get simple food. I got it. Very many of my Playmates uh, felt that the army food was not good, but I must uh, say in this connection that I have found in life that the people who, when traveling, complain that the oysters are never fresh enough and the champagne never cold enough are generally people who at home had neither champagne nor oysters. There was one fellow that we had who was really uh, uh, sharp at gathering eggs. He knew where they all were. And he uh, uh, gathered a, a, a big armful of them one morning. It was very early, about five o'clock, and he was just coming around the corner of a building, and a German officer came around the other way. And they stared at each other for a second, and then he took the eggs that he had in one hand, and he threw them all, about five or six of them, right at the German officer. And the German then ran around the building the other side. And later on, the German said to us in impeccable English, he said, you know, you fellows are lousy soldiers. He said, I've been trying to surrender all night long. And he said, now finally you throw eggs at me. And here he said, I've been trying to surrender. But there were other German soldiers who found surrender less of a problem. This experience was noted by a new member of the 84th Division, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Bowling, Jr then a rifle company commander, and a son of the commanding general. He had only recently escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. By the end of April, A Company had reached the Elbe River. And this started a short, but rather strange life for the men in the unit. Uh, the Germans had naturally withdrawn across the river to the other side, and they permitted us, strangely enough, to enjoy a degree of freedom during the daylight hours. We actually could go out into the river and fish near our banks, of course. But at nighttime, any movement along the river whatsoever drew fire. At that particular time, there was a degree of mixed emotions among the men in the company. There was that particular feeling in which they wanted to go on and be the first unit into Berlin, which had been the division objective ever since they landed in Europe. And at the same time, the soldiers, I don't believe, wanted to have the honor of being the last man, the last casualty in the war. And I must admit, the Elbe looked 
very wide at that time. After uh, just a few days, really, on the Elbe, uh, we awoke one morning and uh, discovered, uh, much to the amazement of everybody, that the far bank was uh, virtually covered with uh, tens of thousands of uh, German soldiers, uh, desperately trying to get across to our side. It was quite apparent that that there was uh, no effort, that this wasn't an attack, and as a result, there was no effort on our part to uh, prevent this crossing. Uh, they were uh, trying to get across on rafts that they had made during the night, and on boats, on inner tubes, any way they could get across, and they were quite successful. And this, of course, was the day when our battalion, and I guess the division, captured the largest number of prisoners. The war wasn't over, but the Germans had decided that they were going to surrender to us rather than to the Russians. One of the lasting memories for me of this last action was when General Bowling and I crossed the, the very swift Elbe River to meet the oncoming Russians. This was on the 26th of April. On the far bank of the river were at least 10,000 German soldiers who had not yet been taken prisoner. Some were wounded, others were sick, and all were thoroughly demoralized. The very sight, though, of so many men trapped there on the other side of the river symbolized for me the total collapse of the German army and the absolute conclusion of hostilities. When we finally encountered the Russians, on the opposite bank of the Elbe, they appeared to be a rather motley, disorganized crew with uh, all kinds of transportation, including horse-drawn wagons, ambulances, motorcycles, bicycles, and even a few riding bareback plow horses. Uh, they were a very friendly, boisterous lot who uh, seemed extremely happy to uh, and meet up with the Americans and uh, finally realize that the war was at an end. For those who met at the Elbe on that April day in 1945, the war had reached its inevitable conclusion. On May 7th, the end would be made official by the formal surrender of all German forces to the Allies. The Third Reich, which Hitler had proclaimed would last a thousand years, now lay buried within the rubble of a devastated Germany. For the majority of Germans, there was nothing left to fight with, nothing left to fight for. For the men of the 84th Infantry Division, there was the knowledge that from the Ruhr to the Rhine, and from the Rhine to the Elbe, they had accomplished every mission. They had been tried by fire, and they had won.